our uh, guest speaker for today. And uh, I have two announcements. One is that uh, Kate has ordered pizza. It's going to arrive at 5 p.m. It's going to be delicious, but we love it. We have to. I hope you enjoy it. And then also the next uh, talk will be on uh, September the 20th, uh, titled uh, Learning Large Scale Sparse Graphical Models, Theory, Algorithm, and, and, and Applications. It's going to be a little bit theoretical, of course, but uh, I hope that you uh, would like it and learn from it. Uh, it's by Dr. Uh, Somaye Sujudi. Uh, she is uh, a, an adjunct professor at the Electrical Engineering Department and Computer Science Department in UC Berkeley. Our guest speaker for today is uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Tim Wang Li. And the title of this talk is The Signal Integrity and How It Fits uh, Your Career. Our guest, um, our uh, uh, basically uh, guest speaker now is, uh, is an application engineer for signal integrity and power, in, uh, power uh, integrity applications in the EE Soft EDA group of Keysight Technology. Tim is currently a PhD candidate concentrating on signal integrity research at University of Colorado. He received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from University of Illinois at Cha Urbana Champaign and uh, Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from University of Colorado at uh, Boulder. In the past years, he has presented papers in design con, co focusing on understanding high speed channels and improving uh, uh, simulation and measurement correlation. Tim is an elect electromagnetism enthusiast, enthusiast and uh, can uh, recite Maxwell's equation in differential form from memory. So here he is. <laughs> okay. Doing the last sentence in my bio just to, to screw with the presenter. <laughs> it's a mouthful to say. And here we are. Again, I'm Tim, and today's talk is about signal integrity and how it fits in your career. The two pieces of this, the first piece is signal integrity, and the second piece is how it fits in your career. So we're going to jump right into it. Believe it or not, signal integrity is all around us, and it's happening right now. There's a transmitter, there's a speaker, and there's a listener, the receiver on that side. And between us, there is a channel. If something were to happen to the channel, then there is a signal integrity problem. Now, to be more specific, today we're going to talk about signal integrity in a digital communication. I right? say we have a CPU and a computer, and they're trying to display something onto the LED display. Between these two, there are numerous things that it has to go through. There's a graphic card, there's a cable, and there's an onboard video processor. And we call these all together interconnects. Between your TX and your RX, they are the interconnects. And for signal integrity, what we're studying is here, is about the problems interconnects introduce and how to avoid them. That's by my advisor. Right now, talk about digital communication. Why digital? Well, we are in a digital age. I'm going to take a poll right now. How many of you, by show of hands, how many of you should Netflix and chill? Show of hands. A lot of you. <laughs> And Snapchat and all these show hands, right? That's most of us. Even Don is doing that just now. <laughs> Send me a snap. So we are at a digital age, but how large are the data? Well, the world is consuming 273 exabyte per month. How big is an exabyte? It's 10 to the 9th gigabyte. It's a giga gigabyte. 
just to give you an idea on how big the number is, 273 exabytes. That's the equivalent of the whole world, 7 billion people, if you count 7 billion of them. Each one of them owns a 32 gigabyte iPod. That's how big 273 exabytes is. And that's happening per month in the world. Well, it ties it all in. How does that relate to you? We have this large amount of data. People are using digital data to store. How does it fit in your career? Simple answer is yes. <laughs> because all these companies are hiring. Keysight is hiring. Amazon is hiring. HP is hiring. Tesla is hiring. Xilinx is hiring. Because everything is going digital now. Even in the cars, you have infotainment systems that's communicating through digital channels. Now, it's, now we know it's important. I'm going to kickstart your career today by studying signal integrity. And today's case study is the case of a failing virtual channel. To do so, to solve these signal integrity problems, we have this three-prone approach. Number one, simulate the channel. Number two, we'll find the root cause of derogation. And number three, we'll explore the design solutions. Write this now. To find the root cause, before that, we'll simulate the channel, right? We'll use eye diagram to do that. Now here are some technical numbers I have to give you. The data rate right now, we're running at 32 gigabit per second. And the Nyquist frequency is half of the data rate, that is 16 gigahertz. And what does an eye diagram look like? It looks like this. Now, after eye diagram looks clean, it goes to the channel, it's degraded. And the transmitter side, a digital one and a zero can be very clearly seen, right? You know, well, if I'm receiving the 0.5 volts level, that's a one. If it's zero level, that's a zero. After it goes to the channel, we don't know what's happening. The machine does not know what's happening. And that's a signal integrity problem. Well, how do we make an eye diagram? We'll start with a PRBS. That stands for pseudo-random binary sequence. As we can see here, the string of ones and zeros occurring in a pseudo-random fashion. We're doing this because we're not sure what kind of data is going to be transferred. So instead of sending a set pattern, we're going to send a pseudo-random binary sequence to, to simulate all of the things that could possibly happen. And here's for record keeping, PRBS. And next, once we have the PRBS, we'll use a knowledge of inter unit intervals. Before I mentioned there is 32 gig gigabit per second. That will translate, you take the inverse of that, you will have a number for the unit interval. If it's 10 gigabit per second, 1 over 10 is 0.1. Well, the unit interval will be 0.1 nanosecond. Now if we take two unit intervals, another two unit interval, and another two unit interval, and overlap them. Let's take the first one, the second one, and the third one. You overlap them, and that is an eye diagram. Now, if you have a very long string of PRBS pattern, and you take a lot of these slices, then you can imagine how the eye diagram will look like. Right? It will look like this. On the left-hand side, very clean eye. We refer to a clean eye because the one and zero can be distinguished. And on the right, a closed eye. Next. See, now we're looking at it in time domain. This is a good place to go to frequency domain. And how we do that, sir? What's your name? Nick. Nick, how do we go from time domain to frequency domain? Uh, Fourier transform. Exactly. And we'll go from here, data rate 32 gigabit per second to Nyquist, 16 gigahertz. And like Nick said, we'll perform on the spot Fourier transform. Bam, right there, we have the, free, the spectrum of this PRBS pattern. Now another question is, my Nyquist is at 16 gigahertz. What's this one? What's this arrow? Which one of the harmonics is there? Nick, would you like to take a, take a stab at it? Uh, that'd be the third harmonic? The ha third harmonic. That's right, because there are two ways to look at this. This looks like a square wave, more or less. Then the square wave has ha odd harmonics. Or you can look at a Fourier transform of a pulse, 
and also would have similar shape like this. Now that's on the transmitter side. We'll take a Fourier transform on the receiver side. Same thing is happening, but as you can see, on the back, the pink one is on the transmitter, and the blue is the receiver. What's happening to the receiving waveform is it's getting attenuated more as the frequency goes higher and higher. Basically means the channel is behaving as a low-pass filter. The channel is behaving like a low-pass filter. And there's a little, physics, a little physics behind it is because as the frequency goes higher and higher, the dipole in the dielectric is trying to follow the, the switching of the field. But when it gets too high, it, some might not follow it, and this quick switching will generate more dielectric loss and also conductor. That's in the frequency domain. Great. Now, just looking at the frequency spectrum, you'll say, wow, we're looking at from 1 gigahertz to, let's go by 1 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. That's a very wide bandwidth. And how many of you have taken microwave class here before? Or going to? Right? Well, usually you look at narrow bandwidth. Right? The Don would say bandwidth close to, like take LTE for example. Bandwidth is about 20 megahertz. And you're doing a matching to that bandwidth. But if you take a look at your high-speed interface, such as USB 2.0, the bandwidth is 1.2 gigahertz. And here is a graphical representation of the comparison. The bottom one, obviously, is the 1.2 gigahertz. And on the top is the 20 megahertz. In high-speed channels, we're designing for a very wide bandwidth. And both of them have their challenges and difficulties for design. OK, getting back to we have so far. We have a channel that we had, and we look at the frequency and time domain of the I diagram. Now, Bibira, what, what, what do we have here? The I is closed. We have a? Signal integrity problem. That's right, because the I is closed. Now, to troubleshoot the signal integrity problem, we'll go to number two. We need to find the root cause of the degradation. To find the root cause, we'll use S parameters. What's S parameters? Here it is. Well, say, well, say we are sending a sine wave at a certain frequency, F0. S11 will tell us what's coming back. Is the reflection coefficient or is it the return loss? In microwave, return loss is defined as negative 20 log of the absolute of S11. But in signal integrity, we use the positive and negative interchangeably. The return loss can be defined also as 20 log S11. What's reflected is S11, but what's going over, going getting transferred is S21. Port 2 excited by port 1. It's also the transmission coefficient. It's also known as the insertion loss. And of course, in the signal integrity convention, Insertion laws can also express in 20 log S21. So you can quote insertion laws a positive number or a negative number. We understand it's all it's in the context because we're dealing with passive designs. We are hoping our transmission lines won't create more energy than we put in. Right, great. Now we have brief knowledge of S parameters and a channel to look like. What do we expect? Right, as engineers, we don't want to just go in and press simulate button or just measure things. We want to be able to use our engineering intuition and practice it to be better engineers. We're given this channel, what do we expect S11 and S21 to be? Well, right now, I cannot give you the answer. But to give you the answer, we will have to take a closer look at the channel. The channel is made of three parts. The first part is a three inch microstrip line and a BS structure to transition from the microstrip line to the three inch strip line. Now here's a cross section of the three inch microstrip line. The width of the line right here is 14 mils, that's a thousandth of an inch, and the height is seven mils. Now given the th rule of thumb, width over height is two, Carter, what, would, what do you think the impedance would be? 
That is very that, that's correct. Very good. <laughs> very good. That's gonna when the width over high is about two, FR4 in impedance is about 50 ohms. But now we have, here we have a little solder mass on top. So it's gonna be a little lower. But 50 ohms is usually a good number. Now here's another three-inch strip line cross section. Given this structure, what would you guess the impedance to be, Carter? 50 ohms again. Great. Because we're great designers. We always we only design 50 ohm transmission lines, right? And knowing these two, we have a little idea of what's going to happen right here. Now Carter just helped me fill fill in here. We have 50 ohm impedance. Now we need to estimate this is the S11 impedance. Now we need to estimate the loss. To estimate loss, I'll give you a hint. The array is 32 gigabit per second, the Nyquist frequency is 16 gigahertz, the estimated loss is negative 0.1 dB per inch per gigahertz. Given that rule of thumb and three inch microstrip and Nyquist is 16 gigahertz, Lauren, what would, what would the loss be? Negative 5 dB. Lauren says negative 5 dB. That is correct. <laughs> They're going to be about negative 5 dB. But now the VI is tricky. The VI is going to be, I'm estimating about small loss and I don't know the impedance. That's what we're going to work with. Let's take a look at S11. Our expectation for S11, 50 ohm, is going to be very low dB value because well matched, nothing is returned to us. Now for S21, like Lauren mentioned, we have negative 5 dB for 3 inch, negative 5 dB on the strip line, two, two transmission lines. All together, it's going to give us about negative 10 dB at the Nyquist 16 gigahertz. So that's our expectation. Let's see what happens in the channel. The S11 actually shows a very different plot. S11 shows, hmm, the ripple is not as I expect, and it goes up to negative 10 dB. That is very interesting. And for the S11, it's even more different than what we expect. There is a dip in S21. The summary of the slide is, well, it's not what we expect. Now, as good engineers, we need to find out what's happening in our channel because things are happening that we're not expecting. Right? To do so, we will implement this divide and conquer scheme. We have three parts, three inch microstrip, we have VS structure, and another three inch strip line. Let's see the three inch microstrip. We're expecting a slow roll off because our channel is a low pass system. Bam, right there. The three inch microstrip is behaving exactly as what we expect. And similarly, for the three inch strip line, it's doing a smooth roll off, quite linear. Now, the VIA is giving us trouble. Now, here are the numbers. With the three inch microstrip, Lauren is. Lauren estimated about negative 5. She's really close, simulated at negative 4.2. And for the 3 inch strip line, Lauren is right on, right on the money. We have negative 5.2. But when I was estimating the VIA loss, instead of a small amount of loss, there is negative 5 dB on Nyquist. But that's a possibility. That's a possibility. VIA, it's going to be the root cause, right? It's I'm wrong there, and I'm also wrong there. So we know VS structure is going to be the possible root cause. Now we need to learn more about the VS to understand it. Uh, here's the VS. Here is an exploded view. I took a measurement. It's about 75 mils, so 0.075 inches. Now given the data rate and Nyquist frequency, I did some math, and I found out at, in the bandwidth, the highest bandwidth, 80 gigahertz, the wavelength is 75 mils, about 75 mils. What does that mean? That means I can fit a wave through that stub. I can fit a wave through that stub. Well, if I can fit a wave through that stub, that means the physical length consists of different voltage levels. And when we have voltage levels varying with physical length, what is that, Brendan? That's correct. That's the definition of a transmission line. When voltage and current vary in magnitude and phase over the physical length, we have a transmission line in our hands. 
So to really understand the root cause, we have to understand transmission line. Now what makes a transmission line? Nick, would you like to take a step? Looking at this plot, we have microstrip over here. How many conductors? One. Two conductors make a transmission line. You're close. Two conductors make a transmission line. And there are two very important parameters for a transmission line. Number one is correct characteristic impedance and the time delay. Character characteristic impedance is related to the cross section. Like the width or the height of the substrate, like we like Carter helped me with a little estimation there, and the dielectric constant. And also related heavily on the capacitance because this structure looks very similar to a parallel plate capacitor. But as far as the time delay goes, let's look at, look at the top view. Given the length, a physical length, the time delay would be the length divided by velocity of propagation. I mean, if you understand the transmission line, what's special about it? Well, if the wave is going through the transmission line and not happening instantaneously, that means there's going to be reflection. A wave coming from impedance one to another impedance number two, something's going to change. Something is going to reflect. If the wave is coming from top going to down, wave doesn't like change, much like we don't like change. We always push back a little bit when something is changing in our lives, and so do waves. When, when the wave seen a impedance discontinuity, it reflects back a little bit. And what we see here is gamma. And Priya, what is gamma? Reflection coefficient. That's right, reflection coefficient. Gamma is reflection coefficient. And it's defined as Z2 minus Z1. So the second guy minus the first guy divided by their sum. If we have a short circuit at Z2, that means we're going to have negative 1. We have open for Z2. That means if the impedance is really high. Using the limit, the gamma will be 1. Everything is reflected. So that can make a little table over here. Is the range of gamma can take from negative 1 to 1. And when we hit 0 in microwave, design, that's what we want. It's well matched. Nothing is reflecting back. Great. We have reflections, we have transmission lines. What else? What does reflection do? What's special about reflections? Well, because of reflections, it gives waves a different wave to travel. Normally, if we are sending a wave from the left to the right over here, usually there are only one path, right? What we imagine is straight, straightforward. But since it's reflective wave, there's reflection, it can travel down and hit the open circuit and reflect back. And let's see what would happen for the straightforward path first. If we're measuring, well, it's nothing special because it's going straight through. But here, I, make a, I put a marker here so we know where we are. Here's where we're measuring the timing. Now let's get to the interesting part. When the other one, when it splits to the stub, and at the frequency, when the length of the stub is just a quarter of the wavelength, the wave would travel down, and it will see a reflection coefficient of one, and it will reflect back. Now, how long did it take? If one way is lambda over four, a quarter, two ways is Priya. One way is lambda over four. You go oh, down and come back. That is lambda. over two. two. That's right. So that's half a wave, delayed by half a wavelength. So here's what it looks like. The marker now is changed by half a wavelength. Now let's take a look at this delay by, like Priya said, lambda over two. Now let's take a look at both of them together. You have the first one and the second one. First one marker, going straight through, pretty straightforward. The second one, delayed. And here is a timing diagram. Right, so delayed by half wavelength. Now, 
They overlap on top of each other. What we're seeing here is a quarter wavelength resonance. And what's happening is it looks like a virtual short. On the black arrow, it looks like nothing is getting transmitted. Not because nothing is transmitted. It's because what we're transmitting at that frequency, the wave, the reflected waves, just coincide with the transmitted wave right on top of each other. And the delay is so mad such that they cancel each other. I'll call that a virtual short. And to extrapolate on this idea, you can see that if the length is lambda over 2, then the round trip delay will be an entire wavelength. Then we have a peak instead of a bin. And that's usually what we design, a mirror band design for to maximize the transmission. The recap on the quarter wavelength stub resonance is the frequency where the physical length of the stub corresponds to a quarter of a wavelength. Then the reflected wave will take a round trip delay of half a wavelength, therefore canceling out the transmitted one. Great, okay, we just went through learning about transmission. Now, where we were is we found a length of 75 mils, and that is a stub. Doing a little calculations, we can find that the resonant frequency is approximately 1.5 over the length in inches to calculate the frequency. This will be a good party trick if you ever happen to have to use this to find the resonant frequency of something. Given the numbers of 75 mils, which is 0 0.075 inches, 1.5 divided by the length in inches, we have about 20 gigahertz. Well, in ADS, in simulation, we can do things very quickly. I created a stop length exactly 75 mils in using S parameter simulation. And guess what? it predicts exactly 20 gigahertz and is very close to the via. What that tells us is that the stuff is a possible root cause. It's not definite yet. It's a possible root cause of the degradation. Right? Because the root cause, because the stuff has having a dip at around 20 gigahertz close to the Nyquist, which is at 16 gigahertz, it's degrading the eye because of this resonance, and we confirm that. It's a possible cause. But there, you can never do enough consistency tests, as Don will tell you. You want to make sure you know exactly what the problem is. From the S parameter, this might be the possible cause. We want to do consistency tests. Now we're going to do it with TDR impedance plot, which is the time domain reflectometry impedance plot. Here's an expression for the impedance plot, how we're going to calculate it. The impedance plot is going to be with time. The horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is impedance. We're going to find out what the impedance of the device under test of the channel is by multiplying the reference mean Z0 times 1 plus gamma over 1 minus gamma. And how are we going to find gamma? We are going to start with step generator and reflection monitor. Once we have the step generator and reflection monitor, we will send an incident wave to the channel. And of course, part of it, when we transmit, part of it is going to reflect. And if we go in more into the channel, and more is going to reflect. We have reflection monitor monitoring what's coming back as V reflected. And the reflection is always changing with time. So we have V reflected over of time divided by V incident of time. That is the Priya, what was it? Reflection coefficient. That's right. Once we have the reflection coefficient gamma, we get back to calculate the Z or the impedance of the channel. That's that's briefly about the TDR. Next. Again, it's our expectations. We have a round trip delay. Given the estimated delay of FR4 is 6 inch per nanosecond and 3 inch microstrip, 
Nick, what is the round trip delay of a three inch microstrip? I'm sorry, I can't read those numbers from here. It's one nanosecond, that's right. <laughs> Didn't calibrate, I need to calibrate. One nanosecond, and for another three inch microstrip line, it's also going to be one nanosecond. And Clara, help me, we have 50, 50 ohms and 50 ohms. So our expectation of the plot would look something like this. But watch out, I put a little 0.5 nanosecond impedance here just to make sure I can see the channel. And the open is at the end, so here it is. We have our 50 ohms, another 50 ohms over here. We don't know what this is, that's the via. Another 50 ohms, and the open circuit. And here is the, here's the timing chart. Okay. Well, we don't know this, but we don't want to just press simulate. We want to take a closer look at the via. We want to look down at where the signal is going to travel through, right? We have the microstrip going to the via, and right here is where things are happening. There is a feed, a strip line feed, and there is a stub. And here is the schematic for that simplified version. We have the impedance of the via, impedance of the stub, impedance of the strip line feed. Looking down from the via, we're going to estimate what impedance we'll see. Now I don't have a good feeling for the stub and the strip line feed. I'm going to guess. It's going to be around 50 ohms. We'll see how this guess, where this guess takes me. And since I'm seeing the strip line feed and the stub in parallel at this blue point, I'm going to estimate the parallel combination will give me about 25 ohm outcome. Or low impedance, 25 ohm. Well, I'll call it low impedance. And let's see. So here's our plot. This is simulated, right? We've predicted it perfectly. We have the line over here, 0.5 nanoseconds, exactly. And we have my echo strip. We have strip line over here, and that's the open. Now, here's a grand reveal right there. It's close to 35 ohms. It's not 25, but you know, I was guessing about the 50 ohms. So it's all right. Here is number keeping. We have Impedance about 35 ohms for the via with a stub, and the round trip delay is pretty small. Now, are we sure there's a stub? I think we're pretty sure, right? The eye is closed, a review, the eye is closed because we found from S parameter, well, there is a dip. Then we make sure we understand what's happening with the stub and what's creating the dip. We double check with TDR, then now. Here's the summary. The root cause of this, the via stuff, is resonating at the frequency close to Nyquist, distorting the input spectrum of our signal, this degrading the eye. Great. What, step two is done. Now we get to explore our design solutions. The root cause was the channel with the via stuff is creating problems because there's a dip. The eye is closed. What was the mo what's the most straightforward way that we can remove the problem? Bibira. If the stub is creating a div, what do we do to the stub? We re remove it. We just remove the stub. And we'll expect the div to be removed as well. And here it is. Indeed. Now, this is another confirmation of our engineering intuition, right? We know now the stub is really the problem because once we remove it, the dip is gone. If the, if the dip is a problem, now the eye should be open. And it does. This is one of the ways you can open up the eyes is remove the stub. <coughs> but if you want to remove the stub in manufacturing, there's a process that's called back drilling. When you have the board already manufactured, the, the, whole, the via holes will be plated, such like this. This actually this is a real problem in industry. And people will pay extra money to back drill the via from, from the back so that the, the stub is removed and this doesn't happen. So this is really applicable to signal. This is a real application problem. But back drilling can be expensive because you need the precision to go back to exactly where the stub is. It can be too much, it can be too little. It has to be enough so the stuff is removed, so that eyes will be open. A lot of people, when 
when, this, <clears throat> when they don't have money, enough budget to remove the stuff, they might decide to not use that channel to transmit that high of the data rate. Remember, I was mentioning our data rate is at 32 gigabit per second. Take a half of that, that will be the Nyquist frequency at 16 gigahertz. And the loss of Nyquist here, I'm just eyeballing here, is about negative 14 dB. That's the fundamental. Like Nick said, well, we have a lot of things at their harmonic, which is about 46 right up here. And some of it is getting sucked up by this stub resonance. That's not good. So we can move our fundamental closer and closer down to a lower frequency, say 18 gigabit per second or 9 gigahertz. And all the important stuff wouldn't be attenuated by our, our stub. So here's our, a quick recap of what I just discussed. And we're we going to lower our data rate, but what's going to happen? We will expect when we lower data rate, we're transmitting fewer bits per second. That means the unit interval is going to be larger. And we also expect the eye to be open because we are moving our Nyquist closer and closer to not the resonance, so farther away from the resonance. And here is what it looks like from, I think, 32 gigabit per second down to 18. So two things we're confirming here. Number one is the unit interval is getting larger. We can see that right here. It started out at 60 picosecond. That's two unit intervals. And it's growing. That is correct. Our engineering aviation is correct. And second, by moving away from the resonance, by lowering our data rate, the eye is indeed opening. So normally, a stub that wouldn't work at 32 gigabit per second, it would actually work at 18 gigabit per second, just because you are staying away from the stub. And a lot of engineers actually leverage that to their design. If I know I'm going to have a stub that's 75 mils, resonating at about 20 gigahertz, well, I just don't run high data rate through it. So I don't need to spend the extra money to back drill the stub. This is option number two. Now, a third way we can get really creative and use equalization to open the eye. Now, here we're talking specifically decision feedback equalization. Equalization, if you check on the dictionary, it says evenly distributed, unif uniformly distributed. That makes sense in terms of a frequency domain. In the frequency domain, Equalization is trying to make sure the spectrum, the low pass filter that we talked about, we apply it with the high pass response. Then the whole thing is just flat. Then everything will be okay. But here, we're talking about digital, digital side. What's happening here is going to be this. We have a receive waveform. We'll go through some processing. And there going to be, there's going to be a symbol detector that tells me this waveform looks like an one or a zero. And when this symbol looks like an one, I make a decision that I'm gonna see a one, so emphasize on the next zero. I know I'm having a one, I better emphasize the next zero. So that's why there's a feedback. So we see the three, the, the part, decision, make a decision over here, feedback, feedback, and then equalize it. And here is the mantra for DFE. If I'm seeing a one, emphasize the next zero. If I'm seeing a zero, emphasize the next one. Here's the DFB. All right, starting with a closed eye, I'm going to apply DFB. In the red waveform is the eye, the what created the eye, very degraded. In the blue is what happened after DFE has been applied. Remember the mantra, if I see a one, I better emphasize the next zero. Here I'm seeing a one. The next one better be attenuated. Bam, right there, it's attenuated. Now if I see a zero, next one better be emphasized the one, right? So next one is boosted. And that's why you see this interesting waveform where you have a little kinks here and there. It's because decision feedback is making decisions on boosting or attenuating the next, next tap, so to speak. 
So next time, you, if you see an eye diagram like this, you can tell your friends, I know that's decision-free value equalization because the kinks you see in the transitions. And here's a comparison between before and after. Before, you had the red curve, eyes severely closed. After DFE, eye is open. Right here, a little summary, a real recap. A DFE algorithm is doing tremendous work by making decisions and boosting and attenuating. You, you get this in the, in the slide, so it, it helps you write your reports. Next. We're at the end, almost the end of the hour. What have we done so far? We looked at the case of a failing channel. Right. First, we simulate the channel to see a closed eye. And maybe that, what, what was that? We had a semi, we have a signal integrity problem when the eye is closed. To deal with the closed eye, we, we apply different techniques. We use S parameters, we use TDR, and then most importantly, we utilize our engineering intuition throughout the exercises to confirm the stuff is creating the problem. Finally, we, ex we explore design solutions. We know the stuff is a problem, we take away the stuff, and we fix it. We find different ways to fix it, given our budget, our timing, and what we are available to do. The next step is Keysight. Keysight is a great company that does a lot of work in digital communication. And here's a quick history. It's built by Bill Hewitt and Dave Packard. So originally, our name is HP. We are the original HP that actually does electronic de design tests. But now you know HP mostly is about computers. But we are we pride, we pride ourselves to be the original HP. That's key set. We believe in hardware plus software plus people equals insight. And key side is you're combining the key to the insight. And that, that's us. We are, we are key side. And given this, we have hardware. You have seen, you have VNAs, scopes. We have software like ADS, like this signal data simulation. We have people with experts in the field, like Don was one of us, doing great work and great knowledge. That means we have a lot of products. We have software products that help you design and test. We also have hardware products. And what does that relate to you? With a lot of different products, we have a lot of di uh, different opportunities for you. And a couple of interns here can, can, can speak out. We have R&D people. If you like coding, if you have designing, we have that. I used, to, I used to be a software engineer as well. Now if you like money, I mean, if you like to like sales, <laughs> you get to interface with customers and you talk, talk to them about how great our product is. Now if you're like me, you like, to, you like the technical content, but then you don't want to talk to too many people in a day, then you become an application engineer. And Taylor, here's where I'm ask, answering your question. I create educational content such as this one to educate university people and in the people in industry on how our tool is valuable to them. And in that way, that helps the few engineers to make more money and help the R&D people to create more product. So that means the in-between. Finally, if you find my talk interesting and you want to work with us, there's the link, jobs at .keysight.com. It's going to be in the PDF as well. And finally, if you do find this signal integrity thing great and you're interested, please come to our workshop. It's a practical guide to signal integrity, basic analysis and concepts. And it's September 17th, 18th. So that's in about two weeks. Pizza dinner, it'll be provided at six. Just a little extra incentive. Signal integrity is not exciting enough. And here's my email if you have any questions. We welcome projects. As a, I, I'm still a student. And what I find is I learn the most when I'm doing things I'm interested in. The reason why I'm in a position of application engineer is not because that's my dream job. It's because what I love to do end up fitting 
into this position. Before I was, before I was in Keysight, I was already using ADS for everything. I use it to plot, I use it to do my texts. It wasn't really effective, but I did my best. But make sure you, you check us out, Keysight, and make sure you come to the, the workshop. Thank you very much. Shall we?